All right. Good afternoon, guys. How you doing? Good. Good. All right. We're ready to press on. We're in lesson number six, and we're talking about Augsburg Confession number four, right? AC four, Article four. Who's got your homework done? I do. All right. Let's hear it all together. The body is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. All right, so we are, we are justified, justified by grace, by grace through faith, in, through faith Jesus in Jesus Christ alone. Good. Have you been saying it a lot? Yes. Yes. Good. That's important because you should have that absolutely memorized for the rest of your life and remember it forever. We are justified or saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Hadley? I even wrote in the Cyrillic alphabet for history. No, oh, that's good. Now it's even better. I can memorize it in Cyrillic. All right. Excellent. So we're justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. What's that mean? Titus? The, um, the only way we are saved is through faith by Jesus, not by our works. Or right. the Bible. The evangelicals believe that the Bible saves us. Okay. And we'll talk more about that. Good. So <clears throat> very good. Now, last time we talked about that the problem that the article is trying to correct is the idea of works righteousness, the idea that somehow what we do earns God's favor. And Article 4 was trying to make very clear, no, that's not what happens. We don't do things to be saved. Now, so we picked it up about a third of the way into Lesson 6. And the very next thing is it says, Rome taught that faith was only, and this is kind of important to kind of realize what's going on, that Rome thought faith mattered, but they had a different idea about faith. For Rome, they understood that faith was simply a matter of what was going on in your head. And so we would say that they understand faith as intellectual assent. That's the fancy way we would say it, that Rome believed that faith was intellectual assent. Now, those are kind of two big words, but what it means is simply what, Jude? Intellectual means in your head, but I don't know what ascent means. All right. Ascent. That's what? that that he, he said going up, but ascent is that's um a that would be with the C A S C E oh. would be. That would be ascent as in rising. This is ascent with two S's. Ascent here means to say yes. That's what ascent means. So when somebody says Will you come over and visit me? And you assent. That means you agree. Okay. So assent is agreement or to say yes. To, to assent is to agree or to say yes. So intellectual assent means saying yes in your head. And in other words, knowing something. And so what Rome is saying then is faith, as they were understanding and defining it, is nothing more than knowing something to be true. So in other words, you can say, I know that it is a cloudy day right now. Okay. Is that true? Yes. And so I'd say, do you guys believe that? Yep. yep. So I say, well, do you trust in the cloudy day to save you? No. That'd be kind of silly, wouldn't it? <laughs> so you see, that becomes part of the big difference. The Bible even says that just knowing about what Jesus did or that God exists that's not faith. So just knowing stuff in your head doesn't count as faith. But that was part of the problem. Rome taught that, yeah, faith is important. you got to know that things happened. But the Bible actually says that it's a little more than that. Jude? Um, say, because Satan, can, uh, Satan does know that Jesus died on the cross, but he doesn't trust it. That's exactly right. And so even the, the devil, even Satan knows that Jesus came and became incarnate. Satan even knows that Jesus died and rose from the dead. He knows that. But does he have faith in God? No. Yeah. And so intellectual assent is not adequate. And so Rome taught that faith was only intellectual <laughs> assent, which in other words, it was just a head thing. It's something that you know, that you know it in your head. And so it's something that you know about. But that's not really faith. That's that's not adequate. In fact, in the Bible, it says, you say that there is one God, good. The demons also believe that, and they tremble. And so just knowing stuff to be true doesn't cut it. That, that's not going to get the job done. Justification is much more than that. So that's our next blank here. Justification means being right. 
or being what you are supposed to be. And who decides what you're supposed to be? Yeah, Hadley? Um, Jesus. Yeah, God does. God tells us what is right, and he tells us what we're supposed to be. And so those next blanks are justification means being right or being what you are supposed to be in your relationships with one another or with another person. That's what it means. And so the whole point of this article on justification by grace through faith is that it's not just a head thing, and it's not just certainly doing works to make God like us, but it's all the gift that God gives to us. Yeah, Oliver. So when God justified you, he was making you right with him. Exactly correct. He's making you right. He's putting you in a right relationship. So you are, you are now what you are supposed to be. I'm a creature who receives God's good gifts. And the key part here that I just said is the creature who receives. So God is the giver, and we are the ones who simply receive what he gives. He has the good gifts. He gives them to us, and we receive them. And that's what makes us right before God. That's what then would justify us, okay? Okay. All right, good. So let's press onward here. So we, I want to talk then about this little phrase I had you memorize, that we are justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And we're going to start at the back and work our way forward. So let's start with the last phrase, justified in Jesus Christ alone. And so the in tells us how this is happening. It's happening in Jesus. It's what he is doing for us. He is the one who makes it all happen. That's the key thing here. So we are justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. So what this means is, this means that it is never ever Jesus plus. In other words, plus something else. It's not Jesus and your good works. It's not Jesus and what you know. It's not it's Jesus and doing Bible. something. It's just, I'll get there in a minute, Jude. It's just Jesus alone. Oliver? So in, in Jesus Christ alone, through faith and by grace, all mean the same thing. No, they don't all mean the same thing. We're going to get, okay, that's why I'm looking, well, I want to talk about each part of this so you understand what's going on. But you're right, they're all very important and they're all necessary, but they're not saying exactly the same kinds of things. That's why we're looking at this. So, all right, it's good. So in Jesus Christ alone means that it is never Jesus plus. And WDTM, written on your worksheet, you know what that means? No. Hadley? What does this mean? Exactly. What does this mean? And so that's a shorthand for what does this mean? So WDTM, what does this mean? That it is never Jesus plus. And so what that means is you don't add anything along. Now, a lot of Christians get messed up here a little bit. They think, yes, Jesus died for me and he rose again. That's great. And now I just got to go to church and he'll give me that gift. Or I just got to make sure I read my Bible on a regular basis or I've got to give my offerings, or I've got to be obedient, or I've got to do my best in my work, and then I'll have God's forgiveness. That would be Jesus plus. That would mean you're adding something to Jesus alone. The point here is that it's Jesus alone. And so alone is the key word we want to emphasize. It's not Jesus plus anything. There's no plus. It's Jesus alone. In Latin, that would be solus Christus. And you maybe have heard that somewhere before. So we would say that we are saved by Christ alone. Solus Christus. Only Christ is what saves us. Jude. Solus, um, no, solo comes from solus. It does. It does. The endings change around in Latin depending on what tense it is or what grant, what number it is or what gender it is and that kind of things. But the um, root is the same, soul. Now, the next point I have here is this means that the foundation and center of our faith is Jesus. Right. Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the center and foundation of our faith. And you guys know my shorthand abbreviation there? Yep. JS with the line that's short for Jesus. Yeah. And the Cairo is short for Christ. Christ. Christ, yes. And those are both from the Greek. Because in Greek, well, actually in Greek, they would write Jesus as a, like this. They would write, I'm sorry, they would write 
that that that's a Yoda and a Sigma. Yeah, Jesus. Right, short for Jesus. And then Christus is the Chai, which is the X, and the Rho, which looks like a big P. All right, so Jesus Christ is the foundation and center of our faith. Now, Jude, you were making some comment earlier, and you said, what isn't then the foundation and center of our faith? You remember what you were saying? Mm -hmm. what, did you, what did you say earlier? You said evangelicals like to believe in what? The Bible. So what's the problem there? The Bible does not save you. The Bible paves the way for you believing in Christ. All right. The Bible paves the way. The Bible tells us the story. The Bible gives us the right story so we tell it the right way. And the Bible is absolutely God's perfect word. It's his inerrant, infallible word. It's very important. But the foundation of your faith is not a book. The foundation of your faith is the living person, Jesus Christ. And I'll put this, say it this way as well. The foundation of your faith is not an idea. It's not an idea like love. That's what saves us, love. Or it's not beauty. Beauty is what saves us. Beautiful things, that's what saves us. And we learn to appreciate beauty. A lot of people have ideas that somehow a noble thought or a principle or a book is the secret to, the, to life. But we would say, no, the foundation of life, the secret to understanding life is a person. Jesus Christ. He is the foundation. He is a living reality. And so we have a personal relationship with him. It's not just a matter of stuff that you have in your head. It's not a matter of stuff that you know or believe. It's not even a matter of stuff that you believe really sincerely. That doesn't matter. What matters is Jesus Christ and that you know that he is the one who saves you and he is the one who's coming again for you. Jesus is the foundation and he is the center of our faith. Does that make sense? Yes. So if you somebody asks you, how do you, why are you a Christian? You would say, because Jesus made me his very own, because I trust him. Okay. That's what it's all about. All right. Good. Now, so we're saved in Jesus Christ alone, and we are saved through faith. So that's the next part we're talking about, through faith. The important teaching here is that faith is not just intellectual assent, but what is faith? Faith is trust, and that's the important word here. Faith, faith is trust, trusting in God, trusting in what he is doing, trusting in his promise. And so that's what we were saying before. Do the devils know that Jesus rose from the dead? Sure. Do sure. they trust him? No. Do they have faith in him? No. And so just having knowledge is not the same as faith. Faith is trust. Go ahead, Titus. Um, it's, uh, does that mean that you have that you're doing something to earn your salvation by having faith? That's a great question. Because even your faith is not something you're doing that wins God's favor. Faith is like the hand that just grabs onto what is given. It, it's what takes what is offered. So God says, here is this gift, and your faith is simply what you say, oh, I'll receive that. But see, even you reaching out to take it is not you doing something that makes you worthy of the gift. God even gives you the arms you need to receive the gift. So you don't do anything that makes it your part. See, some people make the mistake, they'll say, God has this great gift for you. All you've got to do is believe. What's the problem with saying something like that? You just got to believe it. Why is that kind of dangerous, Hadley? Because it's, it's like saying that um, you don't, you, um, there's no part of your, like, baptism. You just need to believe it and you're perfect. Okay, so you're kind of just downplaying baptism and you're making it into a believing thing. That's not, that's a good observation. We'll talk maybe more about that here. Maybe not today, but some down down the road. What else is dangerous about saying Jesus Christ has his great gift for you? All you have to do is believe. Titus? Um, it makes it seem like um, uh, if you're dead, the sinner that you are, there is no way you can do anything. All right. You're right. Oliver, go ahead. It's when you say you you do this, it's works. You're doing that to earn it. Exactly right. You guys are both right on the money that you can't tell a dead person to do something. They're dead. And so if you say to somebody, here's this gift, all you got to do is believe it. 
they can't believe it unless God makes them alive. And then the really important thing here too, like you said, Oliver, is that when you say all you got to do, wait a minute, I'm doing that. That's a work. And it can create the idea that my good believing is what's going to help save me. And if I believe well and I believe rightly, that's going to help save me. And that's, that's important. And so the believing is not something that we're doing to earn favor. It's simply receiving what God gives. Um, so can babies trust? Yes. Yes, they can. And see, this is what's important. Faith is not something that just goes on inside your head. It's a trusting thing. And that's why little babies, even little babies will know when somebody wrong is holding them, right? They like to be with their mommy. And if a stranger starts holding the baby, what do babies often do when they realize someone's holding them? Yeah, they cry. Why? Mm -hmm. Something's not right. And they don't trust this new person. They know who to trust. And so babies already know how to trust and they know how to receive what is given to them. Babies don't do anything to earn that. They just receive it and they trust. So trust is what faith is all about. Titus? I didn't have any. I had okay. to. Oh, Jude. Okay. God was God gave them that ability to trust when, when they were very born, when they were just born. That's right. That's right. So the important teaching is that faith is trust and God gave that trust even to infants. So they can trust his promise. And he gives that trust to us as well, that faith. So why is this important? Because it's not something we do. And because then faith is more than just a head thing. This is also important. What if somebody gets very, very old, and you know some old people, and they start to, their mind starts to not work so well. This sometimes happens to older people, where their, their ability to think and reason gets harder and harder. And sometimes they start to forget things. They might even begin to forget people. They might even forget those they love, then they might even be able to forget about Jesus. So if their mind quits working and they forget about Jesus and they forget about his love, does that mean that they have lost their faith? No. No, because faith isn't something that's tied into their head. Faith is something that God is giving them in their heart, in their trust, in their relationship. And that faith is always there because God helps us to keep that faith going strong. So when we trust Jesus and trust God, that's what faith is all about. Jude? So so if um so so if you're old and you and you forget about Jesus can you still be saved? That's exactly what I'm saying. Yes, that's the whole point because their faith is not something that happens inside their head, it's something that happens in that relationship. And if their brain or their mind stops working the way it should and if they stop forgetting if, start remembering things and start to forget things and they even forget about who jesus is it doesn't mean they've lost their salvation because they still know and their trust that god is their god okay, okay. Yep. all right oliver so if you ask them about their faith they'll be able to talk about it because mm -hmm. they have that faith in their heart yeah they might for a while but sometimes I've, Papa has dealt with people who are sometimes maybe like in a nursing home or in a hospital and their minds are in very messed up. They're getting maybe very mixed up and very confused and they don't know much of anything anymore. And they can't really even talk about their faith anymore. But do I know that they still belong to Jesus and that God still loves them? And they still trust him? I know that. I trust that promise of God that he won't let his people get away from him and he will hang on to them even through their sickness. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. So then the last one is by grace. And so I did this in backwards order. So in Jesus Christ alone, through faith, now by grace. So let's talk about grace just a little bit. And these are some important ideas here when we think about grace, because people have a lot of maybe sometimes mixed up ideas about grace. So let's make sure we understand what's going on here when we talk about grace. So what is grace? Well, grace is a really cool word. In, in, in Latin, it is gratia. Okay, that's what it looks like. And in Greek, it's charis. Okay, oh. and they're all meaning the same thing. So gratia and charis and grace are all meaning the same thing. Now, there are two very different ways to think about grace. I'll go ahead, Jude. Charis sounds sort of like kara, joy. Yeah, it does sound kind of like kara, joy. It's also where we get, um, we get other words from that as well. But it has also the sense of gift. And that's kind of the key thing we're getting across here is this idea of the gift. All right. So grace is gift. It, gratia, charis, gift. Now, 
there are two very different ways of thinking about grace and two different ways of thinking about it or understanding it. And I want you to recognize right away that both of these ways are sometimes talked about in the Bible. Go ahead, Oliver. I think I know what gratia infusa means. All right. So what's that? That's the first one. Gratia infusa. What does that mean? Grace given. All right. You're on the right track. Gratia grace infusa is grace given. But the key idea here is kind of like um, put into is what infused means. Put into. Okay. So gratia infusa is a Latin for grace put into. Now, here's the key idea here. You need to think hard here and try to understand a little bit. And we're going to go back into Luther's Reformation time. What the Roman Catholic Church was teaching was that grace was very important. They believed that. They believed grace mattered a lot. But they understood grace as gratia infusa. They thought that grace was sort of like gasoline for a car. Okay? So a car needs gas to go. And a human being needs gas to be able to earn his salvation. And the gas that he needs to keep going is grace. And so God gives out grace and puts it into us so that we can do the work of being a better person. That's how a lot of Christians still think about grace. Roman Catholics still teach it this way, that God gives grace and then you use that grace to do what you're supposed to do. And you keep on doing better and better things and getting better and better. And all the while, can you do those things without grace? No, of course not. God has to keep on giving you lots and lots and lots of grace so you can keep on working, working, working and doing better and better. And God would give his grace, they would teach, by going to church or by saying your prayers or going to the priest and confessing your sins or doing some sacrament or doing maybe some special pilgrimage to Rome or maybe going and praying to an old relic. And maybe you can earn grace that way. And in Luther's day, they had all kinds of ways to earn grace. And the whole idea was grace is gratia infusa, something that God puts into you that helps you do the work to make God love you. Now, what's the big problem with this idea of gratia infusa? Yeah, Oliver. It's work that you're doing. Exactly. Who's still doing it? You are. Yeah. Who's making it happen? You are. So you are being saved by the good work that you're doing. That's why this is still a problem. This is still simply a form of works righteousness. You understand what I'm saying here? Yes. Okay. Now, the second way of thinking about grace is the way that Luther taught. And this is that nice Latin phrase I've got here for you as well. We have the favor dei, propter. Christum. So let's see if we can take that apart. Favor is the kind of the key word here. Oh, go ahead, Hadley. It means Jesus loves you. It means Jesus loves you. It does mean that eventually, but the exact translation is, is a little different than that. Favor is the idea of, we can even think of it in English, favor. What does a favor mean? Yeah, Titus. Um, so, uh, something uh, that you're doing for another person to be nice. Yeah, something you're doing for another person to be nice, okay? But favor also can mean the good graces or the pleasure or the delight. And so you would say that this person enjoys the favor of all. In fact, if you remember Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol, at the end of the book, it says that Scrooge enjoyed the favor of everyone. And so I think that's what it said, but that's the idea. The favor means everybody likes him. It means you like this person. You have God's favor. So the favor dei, dei means God. And so then the favor means the way of thinking, the um, disposition is kind of a big fancy word, but the attitude someone has. So if somebody sees you with favor, they like you. If somebody sees you with disfavor, they don't like you so much. So the favor dei is the pleasure of God, the love of God. That's the idea. So you're all right about Hadley. The love of Jesus is kind of the idea here. So the favor dei is the good disposition or the outlook of God. 
the positive outlook of God. So God sees you in a positive way. The positive outlook of God. And that's the first part of this. Yeah, Titus? Sort of like in the Benedictus. Um, may, uh, the, may, may God shine his face upon you or something like that. Yes. The, may the grace of God shine upon you in the benediction. That's right. In the, in the favor of God. Look upon May God look upon you with favor. <laughs> and give you peace. That's what we're talking about. So the favor is the smiling of God, his sunny disposition, his positive outlook on you. Now, the last part of this is Pope Propter Christum. I bet you can guess what Christum is. Christian Christ. That's Christ. That's the accusative form for Christ. Propter means on account of. On account of. Propter is the Latin word for on account of. So, Favor Dei Propter Christa means the positive outlook of God on account of Christ. That's how we understand grace. And this is what Martin Luther was teaching. The grace is not the fuel that you need to be a better and better person. Grace is not something given to you so that you can do stuff to make God love you. Grace is not the um, <clears throat> ability to be better and better and better. Grace is something that doesn't happen inside you, but something that God has toward you, okay? So in yeah. other words, the problem with number one, this is still works righteousness. This is still man-centered. I've got to do something. But the second one, it's all about God-centered. It's what God is doing for us that we just receive. Is that making sense? Yes. So... Favor Dei Propter Christum, that's how we understand grace. So when I say that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone, now we can begin to understand what's going on. So which two, which one of these two is being used in our article? Is it number one or number two that we're talking about in article four? Two. Obviously, article is question is definition number two. So when we say we are justified by grace, oh by the favor of God on account of Christ, through faith, oh, that's our trust in that promise. In Jesus Christ alone, that's the object of our trust. We trust in Jesus Christ. We're not trusting in the church or in the Bible. We're trusting in Jesus. He's right. the foundation. Okay? All right. All right. Got all that? Yes. So, and this is all because we're thinking about our relationship with God. Yeah obviously. Right. Okay. Good. So that covers everything here in article four, that we are justified by grace, the favor Dei Propter Christum, through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Now, back to by grace just a little bit. Grazia infusa, we said that this is an idea that somehow God gives you grace. So now that you can start doing the right things and earning God's favor, and that's a big problem. But is there a sense, can you think of an idea where maybe grazia infusa might be true? That God puts grace into us. Go ahead, Oliver. Baptism? Baptism is kind of on the right track. You see, what baptism was, we really say, and Hadley brought up baptism earlier, what baptism is really doing is God is saying, you're mine, and he's making his claim on us. So it's really God expressing his favor. So the propter dei, or the favor dei, is being given in baptism. Go ahead, Oliver. Communion? Communion is another good crack at this, because you're eating and drinking the body and blood of Jesus, and it's going into you. That's probably what you're thinking about. And that's true as well. And so the grace goes into you. But the real point here is not so much that grace is going into you that's the problem. That's not the problem. The problem is what happens afterwards. Because see, the bad teaching that Roman Catholics were doing in Luther's time was they'd say, God puts grace into you so that you can go do something and make God like you. But is there a way that we can talk about God puts grace into us? Yeah. Baptism is God giving his grace to us, and so is the Lord's Supper. And here's the important thing. Is it true that God gives you the ability to do good things? Yes. Yes. And the Bible sometimes talks about that as grace that God gives you grace to love your neighbor. God gives you grace to obey God. God gives you grace to do right things. And so the truth of the matter is, it's not like definition number one is wrong all the time. 
But definition one is a problem when you try to apply it to salvation. Okay. So yeah. doing right things doesn't make God love you more and doesn't give you his, his, his salvation. Doing right things is doing what God wants you to do. We'll talk more about this when we get to article six pretty soon in a week or two here, probably. And so the important thing is the favor day you probe to Christian is what gives us salvation. And then God does also give us grace to be able to obey him and do good works and keep his law and do things to serve other people around him. That's also part of God's work of grace in our lives, but that's not what saves us. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Got all that down? Yes. Yep. All right. Good. Any other questions about lesson number six here and the whole idea of being justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone, Article 4 of the Augsburg Confession. Any other questions you guys have? Go ahead, Oliver. Why did you put in Christ alone through faith by grace in backwards order? I just thought we should talk about Jesus first. That's why. So, so it sort talk of makes Jesus sense first. that you know why the, so you sort of know a bit more about why we're talking about the other. That's stuff right. That's to know the object of our faith and what mm -hmm. we're trusting in. Okay, good. Yeah, Titus. Um, do we get the gratia infusa? Um, when does God give that to us? Well, he gives it to us through the means of grace. So like you talked about communion. So when you go to communion, you know that I've got God's forgiveness. He loves me. I have his favor. I've got the favor day because he's come to me again in this good, beautiful sacrament. But you also know, oh, and he's given me his grace so I can go out now and do what he wants me to do and serve my neighbor and love people around me and be kind. So the Holy Communion gives you that ability. Go ahead, Titus. Take out for your salvation and it's okay. Yeah, you're on the right track. Another person um, who I've learned a lot from is a, a, a theologian and a professor named Gilbert Mylander. And he likes to put it this way. And I think he even learned this from somewhere else. Maybe it was from Helmut Tielecki. But um, Mylander likes to say that grace can be understood as both pardon and power. Okay? And that's kind of nice. The words pardon and power. Because pardon is forgiving. I pardon you. Okay? And so I give you a pardon. Like if a governor pardon somebody from a crime, that means you're not guilty anymore, you're free. Wow. So that's pretty cool. So pardon. Yep. Hadley? So like when in the Bible story we just read that um, the rich man pardoned one of his servants from the big debt. That's exactly right. Pardon is to forgive and to release from debt. Okay, good. Oliver? Uh, I had nothing. It was the same thing as happened. Okay. All right. So pardon is to free somebody and to release them. So grace is pardon. And that would be the favor de e propter Christum, right? The favor mm -hmm. of God. That's pardon. <laughs> so power is sort of like gratia infusa. Jude? So, <clears throat> so, pardon, so pardon is a gift. That's right. Pardon is a gift. You don't earn it. But so is... The other kind of, of thinking about grace as power. So God gives you the gift of grace, and that's power. How would that work? Well, how does power work with grace? Titus? It gives you power to, um, to serve your neighbor. That's exactly right. It gives you power to do the things that God wants you to do, to serve your neighbor, to be patient, to be kind, to be careful in doing your work. It gives you power. So grace is both of those things, power and pardon. The problem with some Christians and with the Roman Catholic Church in Luther's day was that all they were talking about was the power part. And they never talked about the pardon part. And they thought that somehow having grace to do good stuff is what made God love you. That's the big problem. And that's why Luther emphasized so much the favor dei propter Christum. No, it's the kindness of God. It's the forgiveness of God. It's the love of God that he just gives me because of Jesus. So this means that you never have to wonder if God loves you. Never have to wonder because Jesus died and rose for you. You never have to wonder if he'll maybe not like you if you mess up and sin badly. No, his favor is always there for you. That's really comforting. That's pretty cool. You don't ever have to wonder if you've done enough things for God to like you. Oliver? So is grace one of the main things Luther's talking about, or is just... Or is it just one of the things that comes up that's wrong with the church? Or is it one of those big things that's wrong with the church? No, grace is one of those big things. But that's why we're spending so much time on it. And faith is one of those big things. 
and so is Jesus. And so Article 4, the Augsburg Confession, I told you last time, is sort of like the most important article in the entire Book of Concord, and it really is. Now, you can say, well, so is Jesus, and so is the Trinity. True, true, true. I agree. But the idea of what God does for us and what Jesus does for us, that tells us who we are and how we can be right with God. And it gives us so much comfort and so much peace. We don't have to wonder, I wonder if God loves me. I wonder if I'm good enough. Um, have, I, have I worked hard enough? You don't have to ask those questions. You just know that God loves you and you have his grace and it's there. So grace is a big deal word and so is faith and so is Christ. All three, by grace, through faith in Christ alone. That's why I made you memorize it and spend so much time memorizing it. Don't ever forget it. It's the most important thing you'll ever learn in your entire life. Are you meaning this? What? Do you mean this? I absolutely mean that. <laughs> it is the most important thing you will learn in your entire life, that you are justified, you are made right by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Nothing what else. About besides we are God's children that he has given us. That's why. Right. That's right there in there, isn't it? To be yeah. justified by grace through faith in Christ alone means you're so God's it's child. Really summing up all the main things in Christianity. Exactly, exactly right. It's the heart and center of it all. That's why I had you memorize it, and that's why you need to know it, know it, know it, and never forget it. It's the most important thing you'll ever learn. Jude, if you ask the question, "Am I good enough?" the answer will be obviously no. Right, but because of God's love for you in Christ. It doesn't matter that you're good enough. God loves you anyway. That's the whole point. Okay? He is a merciful God. He is a very merciful God. All right. Good, good, good. So we got lesson six all done. Next week, we'll hit yep. lesson seven and start on Augsburg Confession, Article 5. For homework this week, I'm going to have you do some writing, okay? So I want you to write. And I want you to write either a paragraph or... If you want to, you can write a poem. And I want you to write an answer to this question. Why Augsburg Confession, Article 4, matters to me? I think it's not a question, it's a statement. So tell me why in a paragraph, or if you prefer a poem. I won't make you write a poem if you don't want to. We can either do a poem or a paragraph, whatever you like. And tell me why Augsburg Confession, Article 4, matters to me. Okay, so you can think about it and have that ready for me for next week. So you can think about it for a few days before you start working on it. Think about why does Article 4 matter to me? And by Article 4, we're talking about the key thing justified by grace through faith yeah, in, in Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ alone. alone. Yes, Hadley. So can we like type it on the computer? What? We like type it on the computer or the computer? Oh, oh. Yeah, you can submit it to me on either handwritten or typewritten, whatever you want to do, however it's easiest for you, okay? Yeah. All right. Okay, guys, you have a great week. God loves you in Christ perfectly.